Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, <coughs> first of all, thank you for coming along. Uh, after school, any day is always a bit of a tough trial for teachers, so I know you guys are exhausted, and I really hope that this time is going to be worth your while, specifically about the textbook, but also you'll find out I'm going to give you some stuff as well. So hopefully at the end of this, even though you're exhausted, you'll go away feeling a little bit happier that you attended this afternoon. So first of all, if you uh, don't know me, I'll just do a very quick kind of introduction to who I am. So um, my name is Michael Cox. My students love that name because they can always talk about the rude teacher they had during high school, which is great. I do teach at Toowoomba Grammar. Uh, so I drove down yesterday for the first session. Uh, I do have two young kids at home, so I very much enjoyed my sleep at the hotel last night. I'm feeling more human today. Um, aside from being a teacher, though, I do run the History Skills website, so lots of people know me from there as well. Um, I do work also for the BBC. I work as a historical fact checker for the BBC History magazine, three different titles under that, which uh, takes up some spare time, which I enjoy as well. I also have the privilege of being uh, an, a Microsoft Innovative Education Expert, which means that I get to give feedback to Microsoft about education strategies and technology and so forth. So that's a fun part of my job as well. And uh, I am a textbook writer, so that's the capacity with which I'm talking to this afternoon. And the current project with Cambridge University Press, which is due out later on this year, which you guys are interested in, so I'm going to be talking about that today. All right, this is the text. So this is the Senior Yank History for Queensland text. And if you haven't seen the table of contents yet, I just got it up here. I stole this from the website, so uh, you can go and stalk this a bit later. I wanted to point out, firstly, what's available in the textbook, but also point out some of these have digital next to them. What we're trying to do is try and ke keep the cost of this textbook down um, because if we tried to cover all of the chapters or all of the options provided by the syllabus, it'd be a, probably a three volume text that you'd be paying a lot of money for. So to try and keep the printed version at a reasonable cost, lots of these chapters are actually digital ones. So you'll get the physical textbook, but then you can access the digital chapters online, no extra charge. So they are actually part of the textbook, but not actually printed in the textbook itself. So there's a whole wide range of stuff there and we'll talk through them as we go. So, this is the collection of authors for this text. Uh, we have two other authors in the room this afternoon, if my maths uh, is good to me, which it probably isn't. Uh, and if you have a bit of a scan through here, this is also from the website, so you can read this in more detail if you want later on. Uh, this is an incredibly impressive collection of authors for this text. So here we have some Cambridge uh, graduates. We've got some people who are HODs in their schools. We've got people from the state school system, the private system. We've got people with tons of experience writing textbooks before. And when we put this team together about 12 months ago, uh, when we finally signed off on the names, I was very much impressed with the talents that we had uh, poured into this textbook and hopefully that turns into a benefit for you when you use the text as well. So some of those names you'll probably recognise as well. So I've got four aims for the next hour or so that we have together. Hopefully I achieve all of these aims. First of all, I want to get you more comfortable with the syllabus. When we started this textbook project 12 months ago, we had the first draft or the second draft, I think, at that stage, and we were trying to get our heads around what it looked like, how it was supposed to work. And I think the process we went through as authors 12 months ago is where a lot of teachers are at now, which is kind of a grieving process for the old syllabus. Like we taught the old syllabus, we hated the old syllabus, but we're very familiar with it. So now that we've got something new, something substantially different in some respects, we're kind of missing the old thing we hated so much. For example, things like representativeness. What on earth do you do? Try and explain that to, to students. So thankfully, representativeness does not appear in the new syllabus. Representations do, but not representativeness, and we all let out a little cheer. So I think one of the benefits for this afternoon will be letting you get more comfortable with what's required in the new syllabus, so then when you go back and you start next year, you'll feel more confident as well. Number two, based upon what we learn in number one, I want to explain why we've structured the textbook the way we have. So again, when you get your free copy, you can look straight into it, see how you can implement it in your own schools. Third aim for this afternoon, I want to talk through your assessment options and see how you want to apply that to your own school will all be a little bit different. Finally, I want to give you some resources that you can kind of leave with today so you've got stuff you can implement straight away. So supporting you hopefully as much as possible in the next hour. That's my attempt for 60 minutes. Let's see if I achieve that. Right. I do have two little visual keys for you. This is the OneDrive symbol. It's like Google Drive. I'm going to give you a link at the end of this session with all the free resourcey things I'm going to mention. So when you see that up here in the top corner, that's one of the things you can download. And one of the things included is this presentation. So if there's something in here that you like, you can download this presentation at the end as well. The other key that I'm going to have up here is what is going to be in the textbook. So I'll show you some, some visuals of what the textbook physically looks like. 
but also some draft versions which haven't been nailed down yet. So you'll see what things to expect when you get the printed text. All right. So you'll see the symbol there. First free resource I want to give you is a couple of ideas for unit choice. Now I know because we come from disparate schools, we have different kind of uh, stages where we're prepared depending upon our school. Um, I know lots of schools are deciding to start the new syllabus at the end of this year. And for some other subjects, I'm aware of schools that have already started teaching the new syllabus. I know there's some schools which are tr still trying to tr decide their unit choices, so we're all over the place. And hopefully what I'm going to show you will somehow help you in your thought processes as well. So on the OneDrive link I'll give you is a document with seven different ways that you could structure your ancient course, depending on how you want to approach it. Now thankfully, there were two months ago there was an update to the syllabus from QCAA and there were some positive things in there that allows us to have a bit more freedom as we structure this. So for example, if your attempt at structuring your new program is along the grand chronological sweep of history, so a chronological approach, there is one way you could do that. So if you're not sure how you're going to approach it, there's one option. Or maybe you want to just do classical civilization. So there's an option for sequencing as well to give you some ideas. And I'll show you another third example. Perhaps you just want to focus on middle, the Middle East, Mesopotamia. There's some options available to you as well. There's three that I'm giving you. There's seven on the document. And they're just more ideas. If you're still looking at structuring that, there's a couple of easy approaches to that as well. All of that is stuff that we can resource as well. That was a free resource. On to the syllabus. Now, I'm assuming you're as boring as I am and you've spent some time sitting down reading through the syllabus, particularly when you can't sleep at night. So all of you will be very familiar with the fact that there are six very clear objectives set out by the syllabus. Now, this is so structured that the content we have to teach is structured according to these six syllabus uh, objectives. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But also the assessment piece, the ISMGs, are all on these six objectives. So everything is this really clear, consistent structure for the syllabus. So what we decide to do for the textbook is follow exactly the same structure. So the students can see what they need to be learning according to the syllabus and how that's going to be assessed as well. So when you get the textbook, you'll notice the subheadings in the chapters are called objective one according to the syllabus and pretty much copied word for word, modified for names depending if we're doing a personality study or if it's objective three, analysing sources, objective four, objective five and so forth. We intentionally did that not only to get the students in the right frame of mind for learning the content but also when they carry this over to the assessment piece when the ISMG says how did you go with analysing sources they can go back to the textbook and look at that section and hopefully now that on the head as well. So we're trying to make your life a bit easier and also match exactly what the syllabus is requiring us to do. So that's a bit of a guide for you as well. Still on the syllabus, again you probably know this, but for each unit we're told we have 55 nominal hours to teach each unit. There's four units across a two-year course. For each unit, there are two topics we need to choose. You know this. So we need to divide 55 hours by two. So by my very bad maths, that's 27 and a half hours per topic that we need to cover. Now, that might sound like a lot until we realise the syllabus says there are three stages to each topic. The first is a contextual study. It takes 20% of your time. That is five and a half hours. That sounds like a substantial amount of time until you read the syllabus. 6% for the depth study and for our research tasks that includes the 15 hours designated for their research task. So that is not, depending upon your topic, that is not our teaching time, that's part of their research time as well, according to the syllabus. And then we end with 20% concluding study another five and a half hours. So this is all syllabus information. We all know nominal hours are nominal hours. We probably won't do exactly 55 hours, depending upon our school. But according to that, Let's carry over to how Unit 1, Topic 1, is supposed to be approached and, and this will feed us back to the textbook. So according to the syllabus, Unit 1 is focused on the representation of the ancient past. Now, we as ancient history teachers may fall into an old habit, I know when I first saw the new syllabus I thought I'd do this as well, that we'll just be delivering content for the first unit, get them up to speed, teach them basic, th ba basic skills, um, chronology and so forth. But according to this, our main focus should be the representations of the ancient past in Unit 1. The key conceptual understandings we need to cover in this unit are reliability and usefulness of sources, there's our evaluation, interpretations, representations, perspectives, evidence, continuity and change, cause and effect, significance, empathy, contestability. All in Unit 1. That's a lot. 
and it gets messier apparently. If we look at topic one, digging up the past, remember our contextual study was five and a half hours. According to the syllabus, contextual study, this is what we need to cover. Comprehend terms, dot point one. Within comprehend terms, teach them the difference between primary and secondary sources, the ways in which archaeological sites have been discovered, various methods of ex excavation, roles and responsibility of members of an archaeological team, ways in which evidence from the ancient world has been lost and rediscovered. That's dot point one. Dot point two, we need to analyse evidence from historical sources, the problem of authenticity, the reliability of ancient writers who did not witness events that they described, the condition of artefacts and methods and results of scientific analysis in five and a half hours. That's a lot of content and a lot of skills. Now keep in mind, a lot of, skill, a lot of schools are not going to do the full hours for the first unit. A lot of schools are going to be concertinering that down, so they're going to have less than five and a half hours to somehow cover that content. I'm telling you this because we thought we could be clever in the textbook to save you a bit of effort and hopefully uh, meet you in a much better place for this. So let's have a look at the comprehension of terms. According to the syllabus, when they say comprehension of terms, this is all the stuff we're supposed to do. And this is all the historical knowledge stuff from the Australian curriculum, cause and consequence. Um, uh, and it's escaped my mind, but it's on the list there. Um, so continuity and change, perspectives, general concepts, democracy and so forth and so on. That's just the comprehension stuff. This is where I think, teaching ideas for you guys and where we can use a textbook, this is the space where we can do a lot of direct teaching. And this is where we can do reading for understanding particularly when they have to learn how to comprehend and interpret sources. So for a lot of us that's PowerPoints that work, reading activities from the textbook, so direct teaching as well. However, the second dot point is a little harder. This is the analysis of the sources. So according again to the syllabus, this is all the source analysis skills that we know from the old syllabus. So this is audience, this is perspective, this is um, bias and purpose and so forth. All of that within there as well and teaching reliability as part of that, so coming to an evaluative argument. So again, we've got to cover a lot of stuff in those two dot points. Our idea with the textbook, and I'll come back to how we put this together, is to give you resources to cover both of those things, comprehension and source analysis skills, all in the same activity. This way we can cover what we need to do in the time provided. If we can do this, we can do teacher-led analysis activities with the resources we're giving you, or alternatively, or with that, group analysis, where you can give the sources to the students and they can start deconstructing and learning these skills as well. So what this looks like, symbol there for the Cambridge text, is this. So this is an example from one of the chapters that I wrote. The source above here is uh, something about Belzoni and lots of us if we studied ancient Egypt know Belzoni what a great character he is dashing young lad there with a turban on his head and he has this nice descriptive um, account of him carefully going through and destroying everything in Egyptian tombs looking for treasure that's Belzoni so we give the source we start with some comprehension questions so meeting that first dot point what did Belzoni admit to destroying while he's exploring the tombs in Thebes comprehension and we move very quickly in level of complexity to the analysis skills. So do some background research, what training did he have? So we start evaluating Belzoni as a, a source. Should Belzoni be remembered as a pioneer archaeologist? Blah blah blah. So then they've got to come to a conclusion as well. So in the use of one source we've gone comprehension analysis and so forth. That can be half an hour activity, 40, 40 odd minute activity and we're hitting many of those dot points according to the syllabus. So we can do it in five and a half hours, so our kind of approach was providing these resources to you so we can move very quickly, even though we're not, many of you don't have the full five and a half hours. There's another one, this is Howard Carter, so this is his account of discovering the tomb of Tutankhamun, and so it goes through a, a comprehension analysis as well. So we're giving you these things in the textbook that you can just engage with straight away to move very quickly through those key concepts that we need to cover in the syllabus. The other thing we're giving to you is a skills chapter in the textbook. Now, whenever I've spoken at conferences and so forth, the number one topic, and I often do a, a survey on social media, what's your favourite topic for me to present at the conference, it always comes up source analysis and evaluation. So those uh, critical thinking skills. So to help out teachers with this, we've done a designated chapter on the, these skills. And we go through all of the skills provided by the syllabus using their explanations and actually give you examples, give you scaffolds, give you ways of, not only you, but also your students, of engaging with these skills. So this is still from the draft stage. So this is something that we're still 
putting together in a nice pretty fashion. Uh, so it won't look this messy, but you'll get the concept of what it's supposed to look like. We've taken a bit of Bradley here, ancient Egypt, and we go through some activities, some tables the students can use straight away, straight away as well. So the skills chapter in particular is supposed to be something you can resource straight away, but also the students can use. So you can set this as homework activities, class activities, group research and so forth. So hopefully doing a lot within a very short space of time. Right, that was the contextual study. That was five and a half hours. Now we get to the depth study, 16 and a half hours. Now, 16 and a half hours sounds like a lot in comparison to five and a half, until you read all of the stuff that they need to cover in these 16 hours. Not only do we have to do comprehension again, so going back to those six objectives, they have to analyse evidence, devise historical questions, which is interesting because the recommended assessment piece for this task doesn't test their devising of historical questions. Synthesis and evaluation of evidence, all in 16 hours. So if we zero in on some of this that we're supposed to cover, Methods of authentication, nature of sites, role of museums that we need to cover. So according to the syllabus, we have to teach an Aboriginal site. That is a requirement. It can be any site that you choose. In the textbook we provided Lake Mungo and some other research opportunities as well. But whatever you choose there, there's always tons of resources out there. But the other thing we can do with our 16 and a half hours is other sites. Now ostensibly this should be student choice, something the student is interested in can be individual, can be a group study as well. And I must say, and this is where I kind of uh, plug my own success, um, when the first draft of the syllabus came out, you know how you're supposed to give feedback, and we angrily provided feedback and was promptly ignored? Um, <laughs> one of the many things I said was, the options here are very limited. How about these? The one thing they listened to me was that list there. It's almost word for word what I sent in as my feedback. So that's my one success. Um, and that's all I can claim. <laughs> Go me. All right. So there's our research, uh, there's our optional task there. So using those case studies, as they, they're called, then we're meant to go, of, go ahead and analyse, devise historical questions and so forth. In 16 hours, it goes very quickly when you have to do a, bit, a minimum of two case studies, eight hours each. So what we've tried to do in the textbook is give you some options, some teaching ideas for you. Using one of the case studies, complete a class research project. Remember they had to devise historical questions. They won't be assessed on this, but this will actually help us uh, in the lead up. So, class discussion to create research questions. Now this is a skill, a skill that many teachers feel they don't have time to teach in depth. Small group work to find primary and secondary sources to answer those questions. Individual practice of source analysis of a chosen source, because they learnt those skills in the contextual study, now they get to practice them. Teacher-led example of source evaluation, because they've done reliability, now they need to do usefulness. And then group construction of a written response to the original questions that they started with. We feel that would be an efficient way of using the time and set them up for success for the next topic, which we'll get to in a moment. So, in the textbook, you will find activities like this. Dedicated research activities. And this is from a chapter I did on Thebes. So this is um, the ancient Egyptian, Egyptian city with their uh, the Valley of the Kings over the way. So there are dedicated research activities we've designed for you in tabled format like this that you can use straight away. So even if the stu students struggle with some questions, there's some examples here that they can steal as well. So these are scattered throughout each of the chapters. There's things you can draw on, even if you're not teaching the Thebes unit you can move ahead, steal the activity and bring it back to the archaeology section that we're teaching at the start of Year 11. So that's available to you as well. That is still Topic 1, Unit 1. We've just finished the basic study. Now, according to the syllabus, we can watch a film for the concluding study. 20% of time, five and a half hours. You probably sneak in two films if you want. But <coughs> according to the syllabus, it says we can watch Indiana Jones and The Mummy. And we can evaluate the representations of history in these popular texts. And that's probably a bit of a, uh, a reward for those students who've just very quickly gone through all this information we need to teach them. Now we can watch a film, according to the syllabus. And we have to, because the syllabus says so. All right. That is all, Unit 1, Topic 1. And then, according to the syllabus, the recommended assessment piece is a short response to historical sources. Now this is great for us because lots of us do this as our first assessment piece with archaeology already so we can copy that very similarly. The downside is this is the only time they get to see that final external exam format which is at the end of year 12. 
So they're almost two years removed from the best practice they have for that assessment piece. So there's some good and there's some bad. I know some schools are choosing to reverse the order of these assessment pieces to try and bring it a little bit closer. That's the school's decision as well. With that in mind, I'm giving you, this is in the textbook, a great source that would, you know, work really well in that short response to sources exam. And I'm going to read this source to you because according to the syllabus, the whole point of unit one is representations of the past. So if we give them a successful source that can test a whole bunch of skills at the same time, we're effectively using our assessment time as well. So have a listen to this. This is from an impronounceable name that I keep getting wrong. Mark van der Meerup. I think that's right. He says, one of the hardest tasks for the scholar of ancient Egypt is to subject the textual record to historical criticism. Often a single source or a set that presents the same point of view provides the only information on an event or a practice. It is thus difficult to ascertain whether the outcome of a military campaign was as glorious as the author proclaims or even whether the campaign took place at all. In other fields of historical research, the rule that a single testimony is no testimo testimony is often invoked, but this attitude would leave ancient Egyptian history in tatters, as often we have to rely on one source only. Historians need to use great caution. They cannot just accumulate individual statements about a king's reign and present them as a reconstruction of the period. What a great source for the exam. Because it asks some good comprehension questions, it evaluates our primary sources and gets the students thinking how well can we trust the sources available to us? That's in the textbook. All for you. Right. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. QCA has provided an example assessment piece for that first exam. Um, I've actually downloaded all those QCA resources, so if you don't have them, they're on that link that you'll get at the end, so you can plough through them. All freely available, no copyright issues at all, all, used to, all for you to go through. So I won't spend any time on that first assessment piece. We've got that all covered. All right. So if we've done our job well as your textbook authors and we've done our job well as history teachers, by the end of topic one of unit one, this is what the students should already have in their backpack. They should know chronology, kind and types of sources, explicit and implicit meaning, that's part of the comprehension, analysis of origin, motive, audience, perspective and context, evaluation of usefulness and reliability, that's two of the three that they're covering. If we can do that by the end of topic one, Topic two is going to be infinitely easier because we have drastically less time. And this is why it was crucial that we can practice writing inquiry questions now because they need it for the next assessment task in topic two. So efficient use of time, theoretically. I know many schools are under the gun. So this is topic two. Th these are our available options. Now, again, you probably know this, but I just want to do a brief revision. There are student choice in what they do for their research. Here. So we are asked to choose one of these social aspects, so whether it's family, weapons, warfare or so forth, and then we choose which society we're going to focus on. So it could be Roman slavery, for example. So this is going to be our topic two. You know this. The brilliant thing two months ago when QCAA updated their syllabus is they added that last dot point, which wasn't there before, which is you can now choose another society other than the ones listed here which now opens up a few more options to make our chrono chronology study viable, which is great. We're going to steal that for ours at our school. Now, when it gets to the assessment task, again, I'm sure you've read this, is this is going to be a research task by student's choice. They can't choose the topic we've covered in class. So theoretically, according to this part of the syllabus, page numbers over there, we can either choose a social aspect, slavery, and in class we show Roman slavery. For their research tasks, then they do slavery in some other society. So Greek slavery or so forth. Or we can dictate which society we're focusing on. Rome, for example, teach slavery, but then they choose another social aspect under that Roman society. So that's the way it's supposed to operate. Thankfully, we've got that now. So it opens up a few more options for us. So I'll show you what our school is going to do with that topic a little bit later. But again, you probably know all that as well. So back to our time division. This is where I'll point out that according to the syllabus, that centre study, that depth study, that 16 and a half hours has to include the 15 hours the students are spending on their research time. So as teachers, as direct teaching, the time we get face to face with them are theoretically that, that, and the one and a half hours left over from the middle. Now we know as teachers, students are going to do more than 15 hours research. Well, the good students anyway. 
Some of my students will do one hour research the night before. But this is the structure we have to operate under. The 15 hours have to come out from that depth study for their research task. One of the examples, one of the resources that I'm going to give you on OneDrive, it's actually available on the website for Cambridge as well, is a sample chapter, separate to the one you've actually got in the bag today. The sample chapter online is on Spartan Family. Now, most teachers look at that and say, well, I'm never going to teach Spartan Family. <coughs> That's kind of the point, and I'll explain why. Remember, the students can't research what we use as our example in class. So what our school is choosing to do is take the boring option, family. I teach at an all-boys school. Not many boys are going to be choosing family when weapons and warfare are on offer. So the example we're going to use in class is the family, the one they're probably not going to choose for their research. So we're giving you the practice chapter of the family that's been written for Spartan society because what's everyone, everyone going to do for Spartan society? Weapons and warfare. Yeah? So we've got an example chapter on the family. There's a contextual study, the comprehension of terms. So moving through, we want to use that five and a half hours. Remember, this is all the time we have, is to, one, cover the core concepts, get them up to speed very quickly with the social aspects that we're covering. Names, dates, people, places, key concepts, Greek terminology and so forth, whatever we're doing. So there's a lot of direct teaching in there as well. But we want to be using a model of the research process because I have to do 15 hours of this. We don't have 15 hours to show them. We need to model that very, very quickly. So we want to try and combine that as well. So from this example chapter, which is also in the textbook, every chapter starts with a list of key terms. So the students can move into that zone very, very quickly in that five and a half hours. And that's something that you as a teacher can use as well. And we give very clear, understandable illustrations of them to pick that up quickly as well. So as we know, hierarchy is never that neat, it's never that nice, but for a student understanding, that's a clear demonstration as well. So we need to get them up to speed as quickly as possible. So we're trying to give you tools to do that as well. It doesn't have to be teacher-led, can be student-led in the textbook as well. If we can cover that, and during that five and a half hours as well, show a bit of a research process as well, coming up with key inquiry questions, sub-questions, then by the time they get to their 15 hours in their depth study, they know where their starting point is. They can start designing their own questions. That is a long list of stuff that they have to cover in topic two. Thankfully, we don't need to teach it. What that is for is to guide student research. So we know there's students, if we present to them, you've got Spartan society, off you go. What are you going to research? Are you going to look weapons and warfare, architecture and so forth? And then a whole bunch of students would just go, I don't know. So good answer. Go back to the syllabus, look what they've got here. Political institutions including monarchy, kingship, tyranny, republic, democracy. They actually give them specific things that they can start turning into research questions as well. So even though that's a long list, that's very much a student guided list. So if they're struggling with their research, that's a resource that they can access as well. Best advice, send them back there, but in the textbook as well. For the assessment task, we're trying to give you some resources. So this is our research task. That exam was for topic one. This is the research task that they're required for topic two. And according to the syllabus, this has got to be similar to the research task, the source investigation that they do in year 12. They don't tell us what the year 11 requirements are, or we have the year 12 requirements. So this is straight from the syllabus. At our school, we're going to do exactly what the year 12 asks us to do. We're doing in year 11. We're not dumbing it down at all. So we want to set them up for success in year 12. And I'm sure lots of your schools are doing the same thing. So according to this document, they need to find four to six sources for this research task. This is the source investigation. Under the old system, that's not enough sources. That's a very small list of sources. So at our school for the last two years, we've trialled these tasks with our year nines and tens. And there's a whole bunch of schools that have done the same thing. We have found some very silly mistakes we learned early on. And hopefully we can uh, help you avoid making those mistakes as well. For example, we said four to six sources, year tens, off you go. What they do, they found the first four sources they, they could, these are boys, they're very lazy, chucked it on a page, handed in as their assessment piece, and they were rubbish sources. So then our second year, we thought we'd be clever and said, you need a preliminary list of sources. So you now find seven sources and you choose the best four. We're so clever. What did the students do? Found the first four sources, put it on there, added some extra three random sources, and look, here's my preliminary list. So they always find a way to cut corners. So now, we're being far more critical and we're saying we need to tick off those seven preliminary sources before you can proceed to choosing your four. So some of the very simple errors that we make, hopefully you guys benefit from as well. The students have to come up with their own key inquiry question. 
Now that is a requirement of the task. We need to teach that skill. So under the old system, we often gave them an inquiry question or gave them a hypothesis at year 11. And then they went ahead and they tried to work it out from there. And only three to five sub-questions. Now at our school, we prefer just three sub-questions because in the essay writing, each sub-question becomes a body paragraph. So we don't use the full five. They're entirely up to you what your school does, but three to five. So that's going to limit the students as well. Had to create a rationale. So that's the paragraph writing they have to do. They have to analyse and evaluate their sources. So if we cover that in topic one, they can do that in topic two. And a critical summary of evidence. These are the two things that you probably haven't covered by this point. So that's a skill you need to teach. Remember, we've got a skills chapter teaching you how to approach those. And we've got an assessment chapter as well to help you out. This is only task two. To also help you, on OneDrive, I've given you two example assessment tasks. Now, these aren't QCA approved because the whole process isn't opened up yet, so I can't guarantee that there won't be some errors in it. But literally, they give us the template, they give us the information on the syllabus, you copy, paste, and I've just put in an example there. So I'm not showing you the full task there. They're on OneDrive, you can steal them at the end. Right. Where from topic two, we've done our introductory contextual study, we've modelled some of the research process, key inquiry questions, sub questions. They've already done the source analysis and so forth. They need to get into the research task. How on earth do you structure a 15-hour research task that students are going to do that in time? Here's an example. When I teach, I do this in about 18 hours. So I'm modifying it to make the 15 hours work for you. And I've told you on my list here, you remember you have access to this, to this at the end, 10 steps I need to cover, rough equivalent of hours that we can teach each skill, model it to the students, get them to practice before they go to the next step with some example teaching strategies as well. Now, if you tally that, if my math is good, that's 15 hours. Now, our good students, particularly those who go over the top in trying to achieve, will probably double that time at, at home. But with our 15 hours in class, there is benefit in actually modelling this for the students, showing what a good key inquiry question is, getting them to do it in front of you, and they can do additional work at home. So 15 hours is not a lot of time. Like I said, I take about 18 hours of class time. So what I've got here is a snippet from the History Skills website that I have. There is a whole bunch of rules they need to learn with key inquiry questions, which students always get wrong, and it's one of the toughest skills. Don't use a closed question. Don't have a question that I can simply say yes or no, or have a one word answer to. And even my boys in year 12 still struggle with closed questions for key inquiry questions. This is a learnt skill. So there's resources on the History Skills website that you can steal as well. But to help you out and to help students out who genuinely struggle with this, every single chapter of the textbook at the end has examination example questions and investigation questions. So if they genuinely struck, if they can't quite hit it on the head, the textbook provides them a good starting point that they can go off and modify it to their own research task as well. And that's really designed to help those strugglers. But we've also tried to achieve questions that even extension students can really run with as well. So trying to provide a full range of support for you guys as teachers. All right. Sub-questions as well, I won't spend a lot of time. This is again from the, the History Skills website. Sub-questions as well take time to have a good key inquiry question that you can slice up into three dedicated sub-questions. Uh, you'll have that resource when you download that, that at the end. And that is Unit 1, Topic 1. Now I'm not going to spend that much time on all the other stuff. The point I'm trying to make there is we have a lot to do. The students have a lot to do in the first unit and for most schools we're going to contract that time and they need to achieve that in the same time frame as well especially if we're starting year 12 stuff at the end of year 11 which a lot of schools are. So there is a lot we need to do. This is why we've structured the textbook the way we have to try and do a lot of stuff in a very s small space of time. So according to, to unit 2 their next, their next options are personality studies. Now the key difference here, now again we might fall into the trap of just teaching information. According to this, our main concern is the evaluation analysis of the different ways in which that these individuals have been interpreted and represented from ancient to modern times. That is the core concern of this unit. So this is historiography. So looking at how sources have talked about these people. It's not just collection of facts and information. They have to deconstruct what the sources say about these personalities. So here's half the list. Here's the other list. In year 11, we have topic 14. Any other personality that you like. Now, as exciting as that is, and lots of schools will steal that idea, there's a bit of a danger at this stage because if we do take topic 14, we need to make sure there is a personality that has been represented differently over time. Not all historical.
personalities have. So there's a reason why this list exists because these are contestable figures that have different interpretations. So if you're going to do that, make sure you've got some sources your students can sink their teeth into. So the big focus for Unit 2 is this idea of interpretations of the past, the different ways sources can uh, represent the same individual. Did anyone do the uh, Akhenaten webinar for QHTA with me? There was a couple in the last session. One? Excellent. So this will be new, exciting for the rest of you. I'm going to bore you a bit here, Glenn. This is a source that's in the Akhenaten chapter that I wrote for the textbook, and this is one of those great sources which does our job for us. So if we give this to the students, this kind of sets them up for what this unit is all about. Akhenaten, great personality, I love teaching him. And this is from Barry Kemp, I can pronounce his name, but Barry Kemp says, Akhenaten can appear to us as a remarkable and somewhat tragic figure because he seems to have perceived the irrelevance of much of, his, much of the thought of his day, yet was unable to put it in, into place anything that satisfied a man's universal desire for complexity in thought. Good old Akhenaten, brilliant guy. The lack of background sources cripples the historian. So this is, this is why Akhenaten is great for this topic. It has proved impossible to write a history of Akhenaten's reign which does not embrace an element of historical fiction. It is as if one has to decide which actor would, be, would best play the part, an effete, limp-wristed dreamer or a fearsome, despotic madman. He was either one of the two, he can't be both, but the sources give us scope for both. This is why he ma it makes him a great personality that you can either teach or they can research. So whatever personality we choose to teach, again, they can't choose for their research option. So they ha do have that option, the topic 14, they can choose another personality. So again, we're going to choose a bit of a boring one, they can choose a more exciting one as well. So, according to the syllabus, and you can do this in any order that you want, the next one is typically either the research essay, or the uh, essay exam, where they write it in response to historical sources. So I'm going to talk about the uh, history essay based on research here. No, the examination. I've got the wrong heading there. So the examination that they're provided, so they do a personality study for the exam, they do a personality study for their research. For the exam, it has to be an unseen question. Now, for a lot of Year 11s currently, they don't have that. Typically, we kind of prepare them beforehand so they know kind of what the question is, but it's a genuinely unseen question, prepare them for Year 12, and they have to have a student-generated <coughs> hypothesis for this exam. So if we've done our job well in Unit 1, they've done this before. All right. Nine to 12 sources in the exam, so it's double what they had to find in their source investigation. Some of those sources can be seen a week before, the other ones they can't have seen before. This is actually very comfortable for us. We've done this before, it's very, very familiar. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that as, uh, either. The research essay, according to the syllabus, there's our 15 hours of class time over a period of weeks. It has to be a student-generated key question. We can't give them a key question. It has to be a generated hypothesis. And they have to write 1,500 <coughs> to 2,000 words, which is typically bigger than what we're getting them to write at the moment. Now, it's bigger because if you read the syllabus, direct quotes are now counted in the word count, where pr prior to this they weren't. And according to a teacher who's been doing a lot more reading of the exciting documents than I have yesterday, they said that even their footnotes now are counted. So even though that looks like significantly more, it's probably similar to what they're doing now anyway, if you count direct quotes and footnotes and so forth. Bibliographies are still not counted in the word count, and apparently appendices aren't either. They're not in the word count. All right. So again, very comfortable, no surprise there. What we've tried to do, back to the textbook, is use that inquiry approach, that key question generation, the sub-questions, as part of the textbook chapters as well. So it's a resource that the students and you can use. Thankfully, the syllabus starts every unit with example key inquiry questions. They're very nice to us, these syllabus writers. Unfortunately, some of these questions are really bad. Have, have you read through some of these questions? Are great leaders born, not made? Yes. That's a closed question. It's in the syllabus. That's terrible. So these are starting point questions for the students. They should do better than the syllabus. But each unit has some dedicated inquiry questions. Remember, the students can access th this document. They can use that as a starting point and modify it for their research task. So the syllabus has some support. Now, to give you a bit of an idea about how our school is planning on approaching this, I'm doing well for time, this is our map for how we're planning to uh, uh, approach the next two years. Now, I think we're in the minority, our school. Uh, we're going to be sticking to dedicated terms. So we're not starting early. And that's a school decision. Um, but I know a lot of 
schools are not doing that. They're starting year 12 and year 11 and so forth. Uh, but we still have those dates from QCAA that are really early submission dates for those year 12 tasks. So hopefully your school has communi communicated that to you as well. So we have to move very quickly for the year 12 stuff, which is why a lot of schools are starting early. Anyway, this is how we're planning on doing it. We're doing digging up the past required. We're doing family in Ramesside, Egypt. So that's a boring one. The students can choose any of the other options, which they'll be very excited about. We're doing Pericles as our teaching study, but they can choose a personality from the same era, the Persian Wars, the 5th century Athens uh, era. Uh, we're going to go and do Alexander the Great to end. We've got our short response to historical sources. This is our source investigation. We're doing the histor historical research immediately after that to build on those skills, then do our essay exam at the end. So, some pretty red arrows here to show that we've tried to line up when they do this task in year 11, to when they do it in year 12. So they're used to a bit of a sequence for their research task. And I know a lot of schools are doing that. Unfortunately, this also means that this task doesn't happen down here, it's actually here. So for our school, they'll do the same task twice in a row. So that will nail down the essay writing before they then do their research. And as I mentioned at the start, the only time they see the final external exam version is right at the start. So it's a really ugly collection of red arrows, but that's how our school is attempting to approach this as well. Now, as I said, a lot of schools are actually doing this at the end of year 11. So they actually have that completed before year 12 begins, yeah? And that's school decision, that's perfectly viable according, according to the syllabus. That means you've got more time to spend on these two research tasks or whatever you choose down there. But it does mean that a lot of students are doing a lot of work here if you don't truncate the number of assessment pieces. I know that and I think it was in the meeting that we were in, so if you guys don't know Glenn, Glenn's one of the authors uh, of the textbook as well. And when we had our preliminary meeting last year, so 12 months ago, um, one of the other authors was actually part of the syllabus writing project. And uh, they indicated in our meeting that the external exam is going to be similar to the um, long distance, what are they, distance ed student exams at the moment for ancient history. And they're all freely available online as well. So you can jump in, download these exams and have a look at the examples of what Theoretically, according to this discussion, these exams could potentially look like. But aside from that, I haven't heard anything at all. Uh, Glenn and Jenna and, and I, myself and the other writing team um, have, when we tried to do this 12 months ago, trying to guess what QCAA is expecting from us as teachers, uh, we were flying blind as well. So we really hope that what we've tried to do here is combine a lot of stuff. Sorry about the sun there, guys. I feel like um, with the fingers can be <laughs> <laughs> The artin is getting you. Yeah. Um, we tried to do a lot within a small space of time, given the limited information we have. And as QCA has released more drafts and have updated things, I think we felt surprisingly comfortable that everything that we thought was going to happen has ticked all the right boxes. There's very little that we've had to tweak. There are things we had to tweak to make sure we're up to date as well. Um, but we seem to be hitting what we thought we were trying to do 12 months ago as well. Uh, which le leads me on to the other resource that you get in the textbook as well, is we also have a dedicated assessment chapter in the textbook. Now this is also in the draft stage as well, we're trying to finalise the details here, making sure the QCAA is sure at what they're going to assess us on, because out of the four assessment tasks we have to do, one of them we've never really taught before, the source investigation. Now we've done part of that, we've kind of done the source investigation, it's the first steps of any research task, they just don't write the essay, but we haven't done a rationale before, we haven't taught that before. So to try and support you guys as teachers, we thought it was worthwhile, especially in this first year, to give you as much support as we can provide, given the new assessment tasks and the ones we've done before. So this is from the draft document, this is not how it'll appear in the textbook, so I've just taken a, a working document here. We give you example tasks in the textbook, following what QCAA have said. So Theoretically, you can take that and use that as a basis for your own. We're giving you scaffolds that students can use straight away. We're giving you example rationales and so forth that you can point students to and say, this is what this looks like, because there's very little structure about what a rationale actually includes in order to mark them. The ISMG is unfortunately quite vague on how we're going to mark that. So as part of that learning curve, we're trying to make it a bit easier with the assessment chapter as well. With that in mind, before I come back to the workshop aims, what I tried to do, and I've done it in very efficient time, go me, um, is try to show you how we've tried to do a lot with a little, trying to cram a lot in, into the timeframes we have available. 
But also remember, and this is the benefit of the digital world we live in, the textbook that you're buying into is actually a digital textbook as well. And we are contracted as authors to continually update things if required. So if QCA magically changes something, as they probably will in the future, um, it will be live updated as well. So the textbook will remain in line with what is required from the QCAA. So don't feel like you're buying something now and it'll be uh, redundant in two years or whatever. Um, it's part of our job to make sure we've got a document, uh, a resource, that is immediately applicable to where you are. Uh, what I haven't spoken about today, even though the textbook, uh, even though the aims I'm going to go through in a moment didn't specifically mention it, is what the interactive side of it looks like. Uh, I can't actually talk about that because I haven't seen it myself, even though I'm a textbook author. And I have been told by um, Cambridge, the publishers, uh, that the modern history version, the actual uh, preview version of the interactive textbook for the modern version has just been released this week. So you can see what the interactive version will look like. The ancient one is due out in a week or two. I think that's about right. So you can actually see what the functions of the interactive textbook will look like. Um, but aside from that, I haven't seen it either, so I have no information on that side of things as well. All right, so here's what I'm trying to do in our 60 minutes or 55 minutes. First of all, I wanted to make you even more comfortable with what the syllabus requirements are. Hopefully that's true. That you can look at that syllabus and know exactly what you're going to be using your five hours for or so forth. Second thing I want to do is explain the structure of the textbook, what we want to achieve and how we deliver that content to you as well. And remember, there is a full uh, example paragraph in the bags this afternoon. Plus, I've downloaded the other one as a se separate chapter onto that OneDrive document from the Cambridge website. So you've now got multiple chapters you can look at as well. Um, explore the assessment options and help you get, get some resources for the new unit. So I'm giving you free assessment task on OneDrive. I'm giving you the PowerPoint. I'm giving you unit options available as well. And if anything else pops up, I can drop that into the folder as well. So something you can walk away with and use straight away, hopefully. So that's a lot of stuff that I've said in a very short space of time. Are there any questions that you have, either about the textbook, the syllabus, how other schools are operating? I've written other textbooks for other jurisdictions as well, and I've, I've been surprisingly impressed with how much we've been able to do as a, a writing team with the constraints that we had. And when we started the process 12 months ago, we had that one draft document from QCA and that's it. Um, and the original time frame for this text, from our point of view as authors, was to be out in the middle of this year. But unfortunately, when QCAA say something's going to be out, there's a delay, so then we have to wait for that document to come out to confirm everything's okay. And unfortunately, two-week delay here, two-week delay here, and it just keeps pushing us out. So we have been, and <coughs> give you a bit of insight to the, the authorship uh, process, what this involves, is we'll be teaching uh, a full day. This is what happened to me. You know, five, five full periods for us. I'd, I'd get back to my desk, there'd be three emails from the publisher saying this has changed, this has changed, this has changed, can you get, the, can you get it back to me in two days? Uh, two days for rewriting stuff because we want to make it as quickly as possible. So we really did, and we continue, it's still ongoing the final things, trying to get that happening as quickly as possible. So unfortunately the middle of this year has turned into the end of this year, uh, but be guaranteed we in Cambridge have tried as, as fast as we can to do those things. So we do apologise, it's a pain in the neck for resourcing. Um, but we're, we're trying really hard, so, yeah. So for most schools, I think this is a case, um, just anecdotally, so most schools are actually contracting that first unit to something like six weeks or something like that. So even shorter for some schools. Um, my recommendation would be, and this is how I teach, so um, let me take one step back in order to answer this. How many of you are familiar with the History Skills website? So, his, so some of you, yeah. Um, if you access the classroom section of that, you'll see that in some of the lesson resources that I have, I have whole lessons which are just source-based activities, and I've specifically chosen sources that both convey comprehension technique, source analysis, writing a paragraph response, all in one lesson. So with our school, even though we're stay starting, we're going to stay within distinct terms, with all the stuff we need to cover and the stuff that we put into the textbook, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to do source activities straight away that, that teach the basic concepts of chronology and so forth. But that requires choosing really good sources, as you saw before, that one source can convey three different skills that the students are going to demonstrate all in 40 minutes. So I've tried to feed that into the textbook as well, so you have the same kind of sources I'm using. So for those schools that are doing unit one in three, four weeks, uh, it has to be really effective. So ha you, there's no kind of wasted space there. So that would be my recommendation. Find those sources in the textbook, use them as your starting point, and you can surprisingly cover a lot of ground. Before I let you out, 
Um, I want to give you those resources that I promised at the start. So if you've got your phone or if you've got a, a pen, you can write down the link. This is the OneDrive link. It's a tiny URL. It's as short as I could make it. So feel free to stand up and take photos if you need to. If, if it doesn't work for you for whatever reason, I know some schools are very picky with their firewalls, uh, shoot me an email. I'll give you my email address in a moment. Um, I'm happy to send it through in other ways for you. Remember this PowerPoint presentation is going to be on there as well. That uh, Those proof pages from the Cambridge text, that Spartan family one is going to be on there. Um, you can contact me through the History Skills site. So a lot of the thinking behind the History Skills site, which is only about four years old, has also filtered into a lot of the activities in the textbook as well. So if you're still waiting on that textbook, but you're looking for ideas and explanations, uh, jump on there, you'll see, it's entirely free. You can see the, the activities, the analysis, the explanations and so forth. So if you're looking for something to support yourself in the meantime, that's available as well. Um, because this is an a live textbook, we're going to continually update it. I'm more than happy for you to contact me with uh, questions you have, things that you, you like, and that can hopefully filter back into updates to the text, textbook as well. So hopefully this is the first era where you can be in contact with authors of textbooks and your feedback as well will be taken on board for improvements as well. So that is a real offer. Please stay in contact with any questions or concerns that you have. You can also contact Cambridge about that. Uh, if you're on social media, uh, all the history skills connections are there. Um, I've just started a YouTube channel. I'm not much of a YouTuber, uh, but I've started creating short videos for each of the new skills under the new syllabus. This is designed for students with explanations about what the skills mean, what it looks like, with examples using historical sources. That can be used for junior as well. Um, please harass me on that social media as well if you're not much of an e email person. And please stay in contact with Cambridge as well. They've got a Facebook and a Twitter account as well. And give them feedback, things you love, things you'd like to be imp improved in the textbook as well, questions about publishing dates and so forth. So please, I'm standing here face to face as a human being, please uh, feedback to us. We want to know your thoughts and how you're using the text as well. We think it's going to be a great resource. Hopefully you do as well. Uh, but please make that a live community as well.